Hey everybody, it's Natalie B. McKenzie with The Whole Woman and welcome to this week's episode of Living Life Authentically with yours truly. Well, we have had a wonderful weekend. Happy Mother's Day to all those wonderful moms out there, to the moms, the aunties, the godmothers, the neighbors who have been like moms on the block, and just a good friend who's been a shoulder to cry on. We wish you had a wonderful Mother's Day, and we hope your week carries on to something that absolutely honors you and all that you give. So happy Mother's Day. This was an interestingly new one for us this year, but we got through it with a lot of encouragement from friends, a lot of love and support from family and um, onward. It'll never be the first Mother's Day without mom again. How's that? So we have much to look forward to. This week, ladies and gentlemen, our guest is one of those super moms. Her daughter is always involved in some of the coolest things. She is the best mom I can imagine. I would love to have a mom like that if I had one growing up because she, she is so much fun. Anywho, not only is she a great mom and a lot of fun to be around, she's a nonprofit professional, a digital media guru, creative producer. She serves as the director of equity, diversity, and inclusion for Ford's Theater Society in Washington, D.C., and she previously served as a director in production for the theater communications group. Do you get the thread there that this is a woman from the theater space? Yep, she is an award-winning actress and playwright. She's worked in over 50 productions in theater and film. She has been nominated for nine acting awards and is a national gold medal winner for playwriting in the Act So competition. She's the founder and CEO of Brandprint, a full service creative strategy media and production firm of experts who convene on screen. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, help me welcome Erica Lauren Ortiz. Hi, Natalie. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Happy yeah. Mother's Day to you. I happen to know that you are the queen of aunties. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and you did the right thing by introducing me first as Maya Lynn's mom. <laughs> Because that is how you are known. And boy, does Mylan have a lot of fun. She just had a birthday. Happy birthday, Mylan. Yes, she did. Her birthday, she is six years old. And six years ago was when she made me a mom. Right before Mother's Day. It was also a Friday, right before the first Sunday. And oh. so it's been a full circle year for us. That's phenomenal. And I saw her with the princess outfit and outfit and the American dream girl. I know we're doing things a little bit out of order for the whole, <laughs> for living life authentically, but I, can you tell I'm excited? <laughs> I'm excited too. <laughs> it was great to have you back, Erica. Um, Obviously, we know each other well. Obviously, you have, we, we have convened on screen much in the last two years but with your guidance, support, and editing skills and production skills along with Deidre. So um, you are friend and family here at The Whole Woman, but you do so much more. For those who have not met you before, Erica, give us a little background first so we know what went into the sauce because you're such a light and just exude love. What was going on in young Erica's life when she was growing up and where are you from? Yeah, so I said it had been a full circle year for us and I really mean that. I'm from Washington DC originally and um, I studied theater um, growing up. I was always very animated, much like Maya Lynn. Um, and I um, love to perform. Um, I won this playwriting competition that you just talked about and I got $2,000 and a uh, computer. And with that, I decided that I was gonna pay for my first semester of college because unlike what my grandparents, my mother, everybody wanted of me, I didn't wanna be a doctor. I couldn't stand the sight of blood. I figured the only way that I was gonna become a doctor was a PhD. And um, I really wanted to just play one on TV instead. So I paid for my tuition <laughs> and um, decided to study theater here in Maryland. And um, after that, I moved to New York City and I stayed there for 15 years up until this fall. 
So tell me about the family dynamics. Are you from a family of physicians? Um, what was the what, what what was it that caused them to expect you to go off to medical school? Well, you know, um, I was just always very bright. Um, my family is a large family. Um, they are uh, much like many large Southern families where a lot of folks who are smart, um, they kind of get smart and they go to the North, right? They go to school in the North. Um, they start to move their families out of the South. And my mother and my aunt are actually born on the same day, 13 years apart. Mm. And they both went to the same college. They were sort of the two that were, you know, college bound, et cetera. So that was sort of out of my cousins, um, their children, you know, we were also sort of the promise of that next generation. And all of my other cousins are totally bright and also had the same star, but because I was the baby of the baby and she had gone, <laughs> um, <laughs> gone on, you know, to, to do great things, there was this expectation. And my grandfather and I used to always have, um, you know, kind of uh, fights about it. You know, he would just say, oh, you're going to be a doctor when you grow up. And I'd say, no, I can't stand the sight of blood. And we would just <laughs> <laughs> go back and forth about that. So you started theater instead, and you get the chance to play a doctor whenever the opportunity comes up. I think that's a pretty good deal. Yeah. So, Eric, it sounds to me like you've had a far more successful acting career than the average Joe. Tell I us did. a little bit about that. And where did you find your stage? Was that in Maryland, in the D.C. area, or was that in New York? It was both. Um, it's actually what kind of got me to New York. Um, I learned how to get up 95 pretty early on, and um, I would go up to New York for auditions. I would come back to DC for auditions when I moved to New York. And I actually had gotten to a point in my acting career where I was fully booked for the next two years. And um, yeah, not to foreshadow, but this is what kind of gets me into my role because I was. Um, I was performing all the time, but I was not making money. Ah. I was fully booked. I had all the training. I had trained at the Shakespeare Theater. I had had, you know, um, training at T. Schreiber Studio uh, after Edward Norton and all of these amazing places that I worked and I had just was not getting paid. And the industry was a little bit different than it is now, but, um, not by much, but it but it was different. And there were fewer roles that would sustain me. And it wasn't that I wasn't getting paid anything because I was a professional actress. I made my money doing theater, period. But it still was not enough to have a sustainable career. So being an entrepreneurial spirit, the granddaughter of James who kept pushing me to be a doctor, <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to be the best theatrical person I could be. And I started marketing myself. I learned how to do a website. I, I had a black and white headshot website, you know, Ooh. that I built completely out of HTML, <laughs> um, just trying to hustle and, and get a better acting career. I sent out mailers to agents, uh, you know, with uh, flowers. And I really beat the street in terms of trying to really get my career out there. And so then other actors started to ask me, like, how do you do that? Would you mind showing me where do you get this printed? What do you do with this? Or And and that is what really got me into marketing. That's how I learned. That's, that's how I started my business. Necessity is the mother of all invention, they say. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is exciting, Erica. So was this happening while you were in New York or were you in D.C. doing this? Um, it, it was a little bit of both. So um, I started in when I was in Maryland, I was doing it pretty casually. And then after I graduated, um, I went up to New York and I came back here, I think, to do a workshop. And the lady said, you should learn a new skill every summer. And that summer, my skill was bartending. 
And <laughs> cause I knew I needed to get to the city and make some money. So I, I mm. transferred my bartending job up to New York. I moved to New York thinking I was going to be there for three months and I was there for 15 years. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I was hustling, you know, I was trying to figure it out. Um, 15 years in New York, tell us about a little bit of that journey along the way where you won some of these awards. Yeah. So when I, first got to the city, um, I was, I auditioned for this play and it was called Cold April. And it was supposed to be um, just like a, a very casual, like play reading. And it was about the genocide in Rwanda. And it was about um, these children at the St. Maria Goretti Secondary School. And we worked with a genocide survivor who told us her story. And it was an original work. Um, basically at the schools during the genocide, they were running around and saying, are you Hutu? Are you Tutsi? And they had these lists and they wanted the teachers to identify their students so that they could kill them as part of the genocide. So mm -hmm. they were running around to schools with lists and all the Westerners had been evacuated. And so they were looking for students. So the play took place, it told the story of these girls and it told the story of how they decided to stick together. Um, you can look it up. It, it's also in a, another movie called Sometimes in April. Mm -hmm. And um, the play was a huge success and we made a short film about it. And that short film then went on to all kinds of film festivals. We played the Congressional Black Caucus Festival, um, Arizona. And, you know, I, I traveled around with the film for a while. And that was like my first New York experience. And it was so strange because I was working on something I was super passionate about. I was being able to give back. I, I just lucked into like not playing tree number three, you know? <laughs> <laughs> really working on something um, that was really dear to me. And it that became the foundation for, you know, the work that I wanted to do, period, in, in theater. So while you're in New York, how did that bartending skill come in to play? Did that help at all? <laughs> oh, yes. Let me tell you that I met and made so many connections while I was bartending. And um, whether you know it or not, that's also how I know you. Um, I met Deidre's, our producer's <laughs> nephew, <laughs> while I was um, bartending. And he was an actor and had been in movies. And, you know, we met each other, which led me to this wonderful network of folks that, you know, we're now friends with. So I made such um, amazing connections just working in that environment. I also, um, while I was working there, um, was asked by a friend who was doing her graduate Columbia to participate in um, this project for the TKTS booth. And I don't know when the last time you've been to Times Square is, but um, <laughs> there's the big red steps that everybody knows where the booth is located. And that's where you get the discounted Broadway tickets. Well, that steps, those steps are on um, what you call an island. And that island there is um, surrounded by scalpers. And it's surrounded because they're not allowed to scalp their tickets where tickets are being sold. Oh, and boy. So, <laughs> there was nobody out there, though, to help the average tourist if you walked up and wanted to buy a ticket. There was no one there to tell you, like, hey, don't buy from that person, or maybe that person knows what they're talking about, or where do you go? So we did this whole program to get people to learn about the TKTS booth, to experience Broadway shows. We went to go and see everything and learn about everything. And I, I started working for a theater communications group that way. <laughs> and, and theater development fun. So it was-, it was You really have fun. created an opportunity every step of the way from every situation you created an opportunity, carved out a little niche for yourself. And Clearly, you've done quite well. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to push forward just a little bit because you've created uh, brand print convening on screen. And I think, again, that was something that came about from necessity. Let's talk about that real quickly. 
Yeah. So, um, you know, the brand print grew out of sort of that earlier business uh, piece that I was talking about. I started by helping artists and they were my first customers. And um, eventually I moved on to really working with um, mission driven um, for profit organizations and nonprofit organizations. And especially during the pandemic, I was able to help several organizations take their conferences, their large meetings, even the more intimate conversations that they wanted to have and help them to convene on screen. So I worked with everybody from Coalition of Schools Educating Boys and Young Men of Color to the Credible Messenger Mentoring Movement. And what we really did with our clients is we made sure that they were purpose-driven orgs that really needed our help and that could you know, benefit from uh, learning how this technology works. And like I said, I was doing HTML websites at 16. I was always in some sort of tech and, and trying to figure out ways that we could use it to, you know, make it more equitable for everybody online. So they can, it's, so it could be an equalizer for orgs that didn't have a lot of money or, you know, needed to keep their sponsors so that they can continue to, to thrive. You know, Erica, you were the driving force behind us being able to produce um, the tea and tablets, our fundraiser, right out after the pandemic. You know, so the pandemic came in 2020, we couldn't do our annual toy drive. And together with Deidre Tate, you were very instrumental in helping to take us to that on screen place that I personally thought was just never going to happen. So between you and Deidre, you really pushed for that to happen. And again, I watched firsthand how, you know, necessity created yet another opportunity. So let's talk about how you created the opportunity for you to be where you are today. Yeah. So um, when I said this position was really made for me. I one mean it literally. Um, it was created for me. Um, but also all of those various things that I thought were always sort of random about my career, that I was passionate about equity and justice, that I wanted to be a great equalizer, that I wanted to use technology, that I had studied theater, um, really all came together when I was asked to become the Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at Boards. And um, the way that this came about is I was actually recruited for another position in marketing. <laughs> And um, I met Paul Tatro, who is the director of Fords, and we just had some really amazing conversations throughout that interview process. We kept talking about where the theater industry is, how um, we think it could change, what our commitment is to really making um, change in theater and bringing more voices to the stage and off stage, all of the above. And so we got to talking and um, although I didn't get the job that I was recruited for, um, and I'm glad that I didn't because I love my colleague Leah, um, I got this other really amazing job and um, he literally created the position Fords have been doing a lot of work in equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, a lot of the theater industry, just like every other industry, was trying to respond to the events of 2020, trying to figure out how to make a longer-term commitment. Mm -hmm. And Fords took it to another level by creating a senior position on the staff that is solely dedicated to equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and I just want to say, this is very special. Um, there are 75 Lort Theaters, League of Regional Theaters, the big guys that you would think of. Name a big theater in your neighborhood. They're probably a member of Lort. And only 11 of them or so have any position at all that deals with equity, diversity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. Less than a handful of those have senior staff that are solely dedicated. Um, and maybe only one <laughs> or two. I know, I know one other person. So it's, it's very, uh, very special. You know, Erica, at the risk of seeming ignorant, which I probably am because I'm not in that space, what does this role look like and how does that function? Because theater, who's thinking diversity, equity, and inclusion until you really think about it? Because we're yeah. not represented. 
Yeah, well, one of the things that's super unique is that, um, one, we are uh, much more than a theater. We're a theater, a museum, and a historical site. Um, but in terms of like theater making, for example, I'm in the rehearsal rooms. Um, I'm looking at programs. I'm looking at um, casting practices. We are talking about every single thing that you can think of that goes into a show. Supplier diversity. I consulted on menus for our opening night party. So we're mm. really touching vendors, hiring, casting, all sorts of things that go into um, making the soup and, and how it's made, how the sausage is made. Um, Ford's has really entrusted me in touching a lot of different spaces when it comes to that. Also, when you think about Ford's Theater, and I don't know how many of the viewers are familiar, but Ford's Theater is the theater where President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. If you come into the theater, there is literally uh, a, a it's like a ghost, you know, there's a, a, a spirit in that place, right? Um, that is a historical site of political violence. Mm. That now has been transformed into a place where we create theater. You know, we're creating new experiences for visitors that come in the door every day. So what doesn't equity, diversity and inclusion have to do with that? Any, any new person that's coming in experiencing in American history is now learning about it through this new lens, through new voices, through people who are now, you know, the new inhabitants of the space. So, and it sounds to me like a perfect um, venue location because, especially now with the, you've you already have the Smithsonian Museum there, and the addition of the African American Museum, that's got to be something special and an ad added attraction. Let's talk about what you're working on now. What's happening at the Ford's Theater? Because now I'm itching to get to DC to get all into this. So tell us what's going on. So um, there is a lot of really amazing things going on. Um, again, please come and visit um, all year round. But just this week, until the end of this week, you have a chance to see an amazing world premiere musical called Grace. Um, so Grace is an original story. Um, it's by Nolan Williams and Nicole Salter, the book. And Nolan has written this amazing original music that is gospel, R&B inspired. It rocks. Um, there's a standing ovation in the middle of the show that tells you how good the singing is. Um, and... <laughs> Can we share the trailer? I want to yeah, show let's this. Let's see a little bit. Let's and see. then have you tell us all about it. Yes. Yeah. Let's go. Wow. So there you have it. Listen, Grace is awesome. Um, one of the things that is really inspiring about Grace is that it actually is at that sweet spot for Fords where it's at the intersection of history and theater. Um, the Minton family is a real life Philadelphia family that is a culinary family. So Nolan has made a uh, connection in this uh, fictional piece to the Minton family who is now coming together to mourn their matriarch. And they have prepared this meal and the family dynamics and all of the things that are playing out throughout the course of the play are so um, poignant and relevant to so many things that go on today. It's also in a neighborhood that's gentrifying. So it talks a lot about um, how we preserve our history, our cultural traditions, especially with food. Um, we have some amazing ambassadors for the play. Carla Harris, Sheila Johnson have also joined to help to bring this play to Fords and hopefully to Broadway. Um, and it is an amazing, amazing show. So Erica, you say this will feature until the end of this week at Ford's Theater. Broadway, yes, you said possibility. 
What's the time? Follow along. Um, follow along. Uh, anybody who's familiar with the Broadway timelines know that you know these things are a mixture of variables. Um, but Ford's is um, proud to produce this production, and you know the the producers of the show, the, all the creatives, hope that it goes way beyond Ford's. So I hope that you'll check it out and also come to visit us um, in DC. Like I said, it's, it's a historic site that has come to life. Tell us how we do that. Do we get online for tickets or can we just show up? Tell us more about how we can yeah, find so her. And it there's still five days to see Grace. There are still five days to see Grace. So if you're watching this, you have until Saturday and it's, tickets will sell out this week. So come on and get them. Um, we uh, are totally free. We're part of the National Park Service is in partnership with us to operate the historic site. You can come through, visit the museum, learn more about the assassination, about President Lincoln and Lincoln's legacy and the historic site at Fords. Um, so you can visit Fords.org to find out more information about that. Um, you can also come and see shows. We do theater year round. And so um, coming up this next week, we'll be announcing our next season. So we can't wait to you hear about what we've got planned for you there. Um, we also do things like walking tours. There's an amazing show about the assassination that you can participate in online. You can watch One Destiny on our website to learn more about um, the, the whole history of, of Ford's theater. So um, there's lots of ways for you to interact with us. So I hope that you come on by. So we can find you online at forge.org. That's right. How about social media? Is it social? Uh, Forge Theater, um, it's on all platforms. We've got Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, just follow us at Forge Theater. Awesome. And tickets for Grace, did you say they're free? No, tickets for the Forge uh, no. historic site are completely free. Um, Tickets for Grace, uh, you can find on our website at forest.org and they range. Okay. I, I just want a clarification on that. Well, okay. ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with the amazing Erica Lauren Ortiz, mom of Maya Lynn. So Erica, can we follow you, the individual, or are we just sticking to Ford's Theater? Yeah, you can follow me. It's um, at Erica Lauren Ortiz, and you might see lots of photos of my daughter, but occasionally other things. <laughs> So um, is there any chance that we could get a little something out of you as to what might be forthcoming next week in that announcement from Ford Theater? Well, I can tell you that there's another world premiere musical that you are not going to want to miss. Okay. And when will that start? When will it premiere? That'll be next spring. So you've got plenty of time to plan oh. group trips. Come on down. Okay. Check. So road trip, road trip, road trip. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with Erica Lauren Ortiz, the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at Ford's Theater. And we are proud to say that Ford's Theater actually does take this role seriously. And if they didn't, they would have made the wrong choice because Erica takes the role very personally and seriously. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you and we will be checking out forge.org for all things that are happening there. And we'll be following you at Erica Lauren Ortiz on Instagram to learn more about Maya Lynn's travels. <laughs> <laughs> they are exciting. <laughs> Such a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before you go, in the event you missed the opportunity to get your Mother's Day gift box, remember, you can still go online to twwthewholewomanshop, I'm sorry, dot com slash shop and check out our body butter made by Miracle Buttercream. If, of course, if you're going to make your body feel good, you want to have the perfect atmosphere. So you want to get the perfect candle made by <clears throat> Home Sense. And of course, we're still sanitizing and masking. So you want to get your hand sanitizer made by Shoe Cosmetics. All this is the Lady Mist collection, all custom made for the whole woman and available to you at twwthewholewoman.com slash shop. Remember, 15% of all proceeds goes towards the work that we do at fighting atrocities against women worldwide, affectionately known as fall. 
Thank you so much, Erica, for joining us. And remember, every Monday, 6 p.m., right here on Facebook, on the Whole Woman page for Living Life Authentically with yours truly. I wish you enough life to live, enough joy to give, enough love to share. I wish you enough. Good night. <laughs>